Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Secret Origins of Mint Condition, a Thinking Outside the Long Box with Keith edition. I am your guest host, and joining me today is Joe. Hey, Joe, how are you today? I'm pretty good, Keith. How are you doing? Not bad, not bad. I'm trying to stay warm. Um, yeah. Today's episode is about a relatively new comic book imprint from Image Comics called Ghost Machine. There are many uh, creators involved in this imprint, but it was founded by fan favorite writer Jeff Johns and superstar artist Gary Frank. Today, we will be discussing the first two miniseries of the imprint, Geiger and Junkyard Joe. I'm sure as we delve into this, we'll be delving into other you know, surrounding topics as usual, but this, this is the baseline for, the, for today's discussion. So let's start with the first series, Geiger. What are your thoughts on this mini, Joe, and the uh, idea of a new imprint from this fantastic creative team? Well, I like the idea of a new imprint, Keith, because this is what it must have been like in 1961 when Stan and Jack and Steve Dicko created the Marvel Universe. You know, we're getting in on the ground floor. That's kind of exciting. We, we've talked often about, you know, the comics we do like, and but there's a lot of comic books we do not like currently right now. And um, this is a fresh start to a new universe. And um, this is very exciting. And um, full disclosure, I am not a fan of post-apocalyptic anything. I, I was when I was younger. But now as you get older, I, you know, I'm not saying I want to see, you know, go off and watch the, um, the Hallmark channel. No. But, <laughs> but I don't. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of this. But the way Johns creates this universe, starting with Geiger, Tariq Geiger, who's the hero of this story, I guess we could call him an anti-hero. I'm not sure about that even, but um, it's it's just he draws you into this new world. He does a lot of world building. Uh, I believe this was a six issue miniseries, right, Keith? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and we have the uh, oh, there it is, folks. <laughs> there's the because <laughs> the, we are we, we are this is a video we're recording, I think. Uh, so there's the uh, trade paperback. It's a great read. Um, there's some violence, of course, because we're talking about post-apocalyptic uh, America. And there are some pretty strange creatures roaming the land, including and especially the glowing man, i.e. Uh, Geiger. Um, the artwork by Gary Frank is spectacular. And the writing, of course, by Jeff Jones. This is some of his best writing in years. Um, you know, it's... And, and it's a story, um, there's a term for a story that's told to an audience. Uh, I should know this, I was an English major, but <laughs> I forgot. But the story is told to us by these two guys seemingly camping out in the desert, so to speak, the post-apocalyptic desert as, it, as the story opens. So we kind of get their point of view and they speak about what's happened in this world, uh, recent events and even past events. It's set up so beautifully. So um, those are my initial thoughts. Um, it's just this new world that we are brought into, uh, kicking and screaming, by the way. Um, this, the action starts right away. So uh, it's just an amazing, amazing new imprint. And I am looking forward to every new chapter that's succeeding, that's coming. So that's my Yeah. Answer. Yeah. I, 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 I totally agree. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I feel like the thing is, that, you know, the whole post apocalypse a post-apocalyptic, you know, concept has been done and overdone many, many times. Mm -hmm. um, especially the last, like, decade or so, with all these end-of-the-world movies and mm -hmm. uh, all, all that kind of stuff. But what I, one thing, I, I mean, first of all, Jeff John's just a, a master storyteller, so even even a concept that is can sometimes be played out, I think he can always put a, a good take and shine on it. But one of the things I like about it is, um, and this isn't, you know, integral right now to the story, but, like, like you said before uh, about, you know, Stan Lee in, in, in the 60s, he's creating a universe here, a, a world where, yeah, it starts off with Geiger in the year, I believe, like 2030, 2040. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also has roots back in the Revolutionary War, um, mm -hmm. the Vietnam War and other time periods. Um, yes, it starts here, but it's alluding to other characters that will be later tying in in future stories, future minis and ongoing series um and while at the same time this also being very self-contained where you don't feel like you have to worry about other stuff that's coming up um so it's like you know it, there's a lot more to it uh than you know uh, you know what initially meets the eye uh it's you know, again jeff johns and and gary frank in his own right is not only a, a beautiful artist but a 
incredible storyteller. So the two of them together, you know, it's kind of hard for them to, to miss. I completely agree. Now, um, do we want to warn our um, audience that there's going to be a major spoilers alert? Or, or do we want to skirt that? Do we? How much do we want to give away? What do you think? <laughs> well, I feel like um, I feel like it's kind of okay to give some stuff away because I feel like in this case, you know, the um, it's the journey that's the most important part. And I feel like maybe you know this isn't Superman or Batman. People might not pick it up if they don't kind of hear the mm. juice of it all. You know, the, all the good stuff. We can well, leave some stuff out. <laughs> okay, well, I'll start off with one thing. The thing, the thing, as these two guys uh, at the beginning are, are recanting the tale of, of what has happened since the war, um, and uh, they talk about the mysterious glowing man who's in the who's in the uh, Nevada desert. Um, we're told, and at the beginning and throughout the book, that this is a man who will do anything for his family, Tariq Geiger, and that's very important. It's set up at the beginning. And of course, it's it's played out throughout the uh, the um, series, the six issues. Now, Tariq has two families in this in this uh, in this adventure in this book, his original family, and a family he meets later on in the desert. Again, I don't know how much I want to give away, but um, all you need to know is that that while this character is a horrific looking character because he's this glowing nuclear man who has these incredible powers and he's literally a living nuclear bomb kind of like the old uh human bomb character from the uh, the 40s and then later on brought back into the i guess the freedom fighters right in the 70s yeah but he's much more uh powerful and, and deadly than that guy um but it's 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 important to note that while he's an horrific character almost a monster out of a out of a uh uh uh, universal monster movie. He is not a monster as a man. He's he's far from that. Uh, he's a thinking um, man who's 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 lost a lot. He's and he, and um, I, I it didn't go unnoticed that he's you know he's lost in the desert. And I I don't know if this was John thinking, but I it came to me how you know um, uh, Moses and the Israelites were lost in the desert for forty years in the in the Old Testament. And I and there are some biblical references throughout, and there's, there's a few. They're not they don't beat you over the head with them, thank God. Uh, but that's what I took away from this. This this man who's an horrific looking character, and friends, wait till you see the artwork; it's amazing. Um, is is a man? He is still a man despite the transformation he's gone through. So yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, out, out of all the um, generally in these you know post apocalyptic stories. They usually don't have as much heart as this book has, in, in my opinion, um, between both of his families, um, yes. his original family and his, you know, reluctant to be family, family. Yep. Um, but I think his, you know, uh, uh, Tariq Geiger, or my favorite of his nicknames, Joe Glow. I like um, that, Joe Glow. <laughs> I love that. I love that one so much. Um, I feel like, you know, his kind of heart kind of shines through because uh, he's, he, despite everything, Despite everything that happens to him before the nuclear incident, during, after, um, he, he's still very much human, even though he doesn't look the he doesn't look human. Correct, and and, and you know, and that goes um, uh, to a to a, a long line of characters that don't look human, but are very the Incredible Hulk comes yeah. to mind, and and he. He got his start in the desert with a nuclear explosion. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But there are things happening in Tariq's life that um, were already happening to him before the the war and before the bomb was dropped. So, and uh, I don't want we don't want to go into that too much. We don't want to give away too no, much. No, yeah. But and that that one thing you're alluding to also t kind of connects him emotionally to his new family. Yes, very much so. Yes, yeah. Um, and we have, um, we have creatures, what are they called? The night crawlers? Yeah. They're, 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 what are they, giant insects or, or tarantulas? Yeah, they, they look, I mean, I don't think it, it's saying too much to say that, you know, uh, this, something happened, a, a large nuclear event, um, and it's basically affected not just Joe, but a lot of the creatures yes. um, in, in this particular area. Again, as of right now, we don't know how what the rest of the world is up to, but we know America is kind of like 
a bit of a wasteland, you know, a, you know, a bit of a Mad Max kind of feel thing going on. Mm-hmm. There. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, great now, Mad Max. Yeah, there are there there are many uh, hazards in this desert, including um, the people who live in uh, the restored Las Vegas. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, and all the different the casinos and and how they operate, and it's this just just you know uh, underworld. Um, excuse me, this underworld um, affiliation, loosely affiliated, and of course they're all jockeying for positions to to outdo each other, and we have one character. Um, is he, what is he, he's, he's the king, right? So to speak. The yeah. Uh, the king. Yes. Yeah. And he got there. You know, he he was a prince who uh, mm-hmm. got himself to be the king through some uh, dubious, you know, uh, circumstances. Yes, and he seems to be the main antagonist. Although there are others, there are the um, uh, the group that hunt uh, for organs, right? That, yep. Uh, yeah, there's that. So there's a lot of really strange and weird stuff going on. This is this is this is great sci-fi. It's horrific. Yeah. But as Keith said, it's it's a um, it's a story about you know uh, that has heart to it, a lot of heart to it, and the heart is, is Tariq and a few people we meet later on, his uh, his new family, and it, it, yeah. it just it just pulls you in, and you just want to read it, read read it. And um, I'm looking at some, some of my notes here. Um, uh, well, I don't want to get to that yet. <laughs> I was jump. I was jump ahead. But we want to. <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say other than um, it's 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 unlike anything I've. It's it's based on past, whether literature and movies and TV, apocalyptic nuclear uh, adventures, but it's very fresh and original at the same time. And I think that's what uh, Johns was shooting for. How can I put a spin on this old trope? And I think he does it very, very well. Very well. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that makes it exciting, well, first I'll say um, Jeff Johns has a, a few really strong qualities in his writing. Uh, characterization, mm-hmm. um, a love of history of the of the characters. Now, that wouldn't apply too much in this because it's a brand new universe. But also, I think more importantly, uh, world building. We've yeah. seen a ton of his war- world building in you know, uh, Green Lantern, um, especially uh, his first run on The Flash, uh, pretty much everything he touches, JSA, a lot of world building. And in this, he's doing it, um, you know, probably some of his best work. He, he literally is creating not just the modern world uh, firsthand. He's also going back in time. Again, this this what, what they're kind of affectionately calling the unmanned universe um, unnamed, I'm sorry, unnamed, unnamed universe. Yeah, unnamed, yeah. unmanned, I was thinking of Why the Last Man, another similar story. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, the unnamed universe, which basically starts um, on uh, the, the Christmas of, ni- of 1776. Mm-hmm. That's when it all kicks off, the first you know story, with, with another character that um, they allude to, but we won't meet for a while longer, um, uh, named Redcoat, which I'm looking forward to that very much. Yep. Yeah, yep, you got a timeline. There's the timeline. You, it's, you're getting it on the ground floor. You really are. You, you're not going to be confused. You're going to go along for a really wild ride. Yeah, it's it's excellent. I mean, um, and also just so you know, it's it's uh, for for you know listeners out there, both tray paperbacks are on Amazon, super cheap. They're like ten, maybe eleven dollars each, and you get yeah, six like issues. That, yeah. yeah, of of Jeff Johns and Gary Frank. Um, just uh, you can't get any more bang for your buck. Um, it's just a really exciting world. Um, and uh, we can talk about it a little more maybe after we uh, talk about Junkyard Joe, but there's other books that are coming out from Jeff from Johns and also other creators that kind of tie it, that are obviously a part of this tapestry, this world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, but these two, you know, the guy who's like the lead, he seems to be kind of like the, the Superman um, of this world. I mean, not... Yeah. Not anything like the character, but he's the the main character. I feel like of this universe because even in Junkyard Joe and other stories, they refer to him over and over. Um, no, he's he's such, definitely the seminal character of this new universe. Yes, without a doubt. Absolutely, um, and just uh, uh, really, gr- Joe. What Joe said before is so right. It it really Jeff Johns. I even uh, he said it in a few interviews I've I've read where um, you know. He, he can kind of boil down a lot of Jeff John's series down to like, you know, to, to one thing, to like one or two sentences. I mean, there's so much more to it, but the basic, like, 
premise, and this is, um, it really is all about what a person will do to protect their family, how far mm-hmm. they'll go, uh, and their family being the most important thing to them. Um, and that shines through. You know, him himself, he said he kind of got the inspiration because after he became a father, he was just like looked at his, uh, his I think his first son and was just like, uh, God, I would do anything for you. I would kill for you. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what, you know, very like was like the first seeds of, of Geiger. Yeah, without a doubt. Very much so. And and um and this this hero does kill. Uh and um some of it is as you said you said before, it's very horrific. And um you can you if you when you read the read the um the graphic novel, you can judge for yourself if was he justified or not. Uh, but and and you know, to John's credit, it's not just, you know, a, a black and white story. There it's so nuanced. Uh yeah, there, there are there are there are very evil villains in here, but there are other characters that um, that uh, have agendas. But are they? You know, I'm thinking of the, the um, near the end when we meet uh, 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 the government, so to speak. What's yeah. their agenda? Uh, there are some good people there, but there are some not so good people there. Um, it's it just it just um, it's not cut and dried. It's not again. I, you, Stan and Jack were, and Steve were creating a universe back in the day, and it was kind of like, you know, superheroes with problems, and that's as far as they went for a while. And then they upped their game a little bit further. This is, you know, the problem is already here. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a post-nuclear uh, nuclear world. So um, you, 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 things are going to be uh, uh, definitely not black and white. They're going to be very nuanced. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to make up your mind as you're reading this, um, how you feel about these characters. And that's yeah. that's good writing. Yeah, and this for everyone knows before we you know wrap up Geiger at some point and go to Junkyard Joe. The, the, the basic premise is um, a man who was caught right dead center of a nuclear detonation, um, but he has his family basically in a bunker, mm-hmm. um, and he's stuck outside, just protecting that bunker at all costs from the outside world until he hopes. Uh, the contamination outside, uh, you know, kind of goes away or is you know, livable, sustainable. And then he can, you know, be reunited with his family again. And then that's literally where the first issue begins. And you you kind of go on this journey with him, both in the, the future and the past. Uh, it's, it's very, very exciting. Right. And, and um, the nuclear explosion that he's caught in does... Um change him but he was already changing before that because of of his condition his medical condition and those two things come together and that, that's what creates um um uh, joe glow as you said or uh yeah i, yeah, I, yeah. I, I like the glowing man i just like the glow it just sounds there's, so there's, mysterious you know, the glowing the, man. uh yep there's yeah. the the glowing man joe glow the meltdown man the meltdown uh, man i forgot that one <laughs> yeah 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 um yeah. I think that might be it. I think that's all of them. Yeah, they um, do a few, but those are the three that come to mind. Yeah, it really um, does. It does feel like um, it feels like Jeff Johns was inspired by the early Marvel universe too, just based on the the type, you know, the accident that makes him, you know, mm-hmm. Joe Glow. Um, it does feel like the Hulk origin in, in a lot of ways. It's not, you know, it's, it, it feels like it. Well, I think you know, I, I think that's on purpose, and um, even though it's been. 63 years, 1961. Um, um, I was very young. I was a little boy, but I do remember the quote unquote missiles of October uh, when the world came the closest it's ever been to a nuclear, nuclear war. And, um, you know, Stan, you, you read the early Marvel comics and uh, it's a lot of it is cold war material in, in the background. And we're living in a time right now where, you know, things in the world are not going too well and, you know, it, 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 to me, because I've lived through it already, it, it feels like the Cold War is coming back. And uh, I think Johns is very prescient about these these things. And I think this is uh, partly what inspired him, what you said before about him being a dad and he would do anything, even kill for his children, which any dad or mom would do, I, I, I would think. So, um, yeah, uh, there's a lot of real world, you know, all science fiction is, is metaphor. It extrapolates what we see in the real world and puts it off into the future or into a, uh, an alternate universe or a, a you know, whatever, a, a post apocalyptic uh, world. So um, it, it doesn't just come out of the, out of, you know, out of the, um, 
full blown out of, out of uh, uh, the air. It's, it has its, um, its roots in what's going on presently. And I think that's very much part, part of the story. Yeah, I, I, I thousand percent agree. When I, one thing I like about it, um, as I said, it's a lot of things seeded for other, you know, future books and, you know, stuff going, I think it's, I think it's going to be like probably like a five to 10 year journey, um, th- you know, for this story. And I do believe it'll have an end. Um, it's, cause I have a lot of interviews recently with Jeff Johns, he's indicated that's what, something he wants to do, ha- tell a story that actually ends and someone else doesn't pick up the character years later and do something else with it. He said, one of the things he loved doing Green Lantern and he understands the concept of, you know, the shared universe and mm-hmm. you know, these, these aren't characters he owns, but um, there's something a little, not disappointing, but uh, he would have liked to kind of, for his last Green Lantern story to be like the, the final word on Hal in a sense, you know, mm-hmm. he understands that it's not his character and that I'm sure a part of him also wants Hal to live forever. But um uh, there's just something there. So I think he really wanted to tell an epic tale like what Green Lantern was, um, you know, nine years of, you know, it's a great story. Um, but I think he wants to kind of put like, you know, a period at the end of this. And um, he's got some great collaborators, you know, working with him. Because in this book, the most seated thing is Junkyard Joe. There's mm. pages of a Junkyard Joe comic that looks silly and fun throughout the series um it's a part of the pop culture of this world um that we're you know that we're reading about um you know there's theme parks uh with, with junkyard joe there's toys there's lunch boxes boxes yeah um, exactly yeah uh comic strips um and you know and when you um when you're reading it you don't really think much about it you know that it's going to be another book at some point because you know, john's talked about that um early on but you know it just looked like a fun little thing and um, a little segue, I guess, to, to the next topic. But man, Junkyard Joe blew me away. Um, same exact creative team, Johns and Gary Frank again. And this book, um, as much as I really love Geiger, this one's even better. Um, I don't know what you think about this one, Joe, but uh, what are your initial thoughts on on Junkyard Joe? Well, uh, I'm, I, it's the best thing I've read in years, period. Uh, not only by Johns, but anybody in the in, in the in the medium of comic books presently. Um, and I like. The, before I go on to that, though, I want to. One thing you said about that he sees this as a as a, uh, a universe coming to an end. And I was gonna. I was thinking about that today, especially after I read Junkyard Joe. And um, yeah, I think he's got a plan here. He's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, or three act play, so to speak, whatever. But I do want to see this story end at some point. I don't want to see like other people coming on and ruining these characters. Um, this this wasn't invented to be, you know, the Fantastic Four or Spider-Man or Batman and Superman from 85 years ago. This was something that was going to have a beginning and a middle and an end. Now, Junkyard Joe. Ah, uh, wow. You talk about a character-driven story. That's what this... I mean, Johns is... Um, he writes great dialogue. He writes great characters. Um, he introduces... and And again... This book is about family. It's about it's about Muddy Davis, his his his, his, um, his original family, so to speak, in the in the, uh, in the in the in the jungles of Nam, and then fifty years later, the new family who moves in next door to him, and what happens between that, and uh, it's just it's it's so. Muddy Davis is one of the. Um, most interesting characters I've read in comic books in a long, long time, and you're gonna, folks, you're gonna love this character. He is, you just, you just wish he was your grandfather or whoever. <laughs> he's such a great person, but he's got a, you know, he's got an incredibly horrific background too, because he was, he was in Nam and and uh, he 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 survived the tragedy, and that's where Junkyard Joe comes in. You want to take it from? Yeah, there? um, yeah, there's um, like you know you. I didn't really, I guess, think about it too much uh, after I read it, but when you were just talking about it, um, there's parallels, you know, between um, uh, Geiger's original family and his new family and Muddy Davis with his Vietnam family and his wife. And then later, he also gets a new kind of adopted later in life family that 
um, kind of helps him through a, a difficult time. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that way, it's kind of the opposite of, of Geiger. But again, they, they have this parallel of finding a new family and the book being about heart and and mm -hmm. and family and basically um it's amazing in my, in my mind how you know muddy davis is for the most of the series is you know an old an older gentleman probably in his right. like, late 70s yep. and you know you're the story is being told through his eyes that you know junkyard joe this robot doesn't talk <laughs> no, <laughs> he has, doesn't. you know he doesn't speak He's a robot. He whirs and clicks a lot, but that's about it. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's a fascinating way, fascinating way to tell a story. You're basically getting the perspective um, through, you know, uh, this older man um, and his relationship with this character, both as a real robot and also as a comic strip that he later created after he met him. Um, it's really, really, really good. Uh, Gary Frank and, and Jeff Johns are just uh, wonderful storytellers together. Um, you know, the villains are extremely villainous in this story. Um, and I even think that, uh, I even think that the, the gore factor is kind of dialed up a notch from even Geiger. But again, it's horrific, but it's, it's offset by so much heart and humor. Jeff Johns has a lot of humor in both mm -hmm. of these books. Mm -hmm. I would say probably more so in this one is because this of the characters. Yeah, right. Um, so I, yeah, I love Junk Jar Jar. I think it's such a great book. Um, and, you know, at, at one point in Geiger, Junk Jar Joe really crosses over. I think you'll you'll all really enjoy it. I You know, I recommend reading Geiger, reading Junk Jar Joe, and then going back and reading Geiger again, because yeah. Geiger will mean more to you then, I yep, feel. It did. Yeah, I've reread them both. I reread uh, Junk Jar Joe again this morning. Um, yeah, it's uh, as you said. It's um, it's a parallel, kind of a parallel, with the families to Geiger, uh, and and the and the violence in Junkyard Joe is is not gratuitous because we, it starts out in Vietnam, and you know, uh, right. we lost we lost fifty five thousand young men uh, in, in Vietnam. Uh, I remember every night eating dinner, and you would watch the news and. They'd give you the okay today. They'd give you the count, and the number would keep going up and up and up. And all you saw was those helicopters pulling those boys out of those rice paddies of the jungles and trying to save their lives, rushing them off to a, a, a mash hospital, a mash unit. And um, it's uh, you know it's something that's always stayed with me, and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. And this this brought that back when I read this. And um, as you know, we um, um, I have three cousins that went to to Nam and came back. You know, one of them, Frank. Yeah, yeah, and um, it leaves a scar on you, uh, if not uh, if not uh, physically, mentally, and 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 Muddy is is a, is a scarred man when he comes back, and he and he's told by and I mentioned the word mash. You brought this up, not me. I mean, you you brought this up first on our discussion. <laughs> There's a scene where he's he's in the um, he's in the uh, the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital because he's the only one that survives his um, his uh, the attack on his unit. And there's a doctor who's telling him, "Hey, you, you stop talking about this robot because they're gonna, you're gonna get sent home in a different way, and you're gonna, you know." Yeah. Gonna, and the doctor looks just like uh, Alan Alda from from Mitch. Yeah, Hawkeye. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Hawkeye, yeah. But um, you know, the the uh, getting back to the violence, it's more horrific in this because, you know, the violence in Geiger, it's it, these are all these like mutated people and mutated monsters that are getting killed and. And whatnot, but these are real boys. These are guys in Vietnam, guys in their late teens and early twenties. Uh, an older sergeant who only wants to get back to his girl, his, his little girl. They all want to get. They, they, that's it. They want to get back home. They want to get back home. And obviously, anybody in that situation would want to. So when they when they meet their untimely end, you know, when they're when they're shot uh, by the by the enemy, it's pretty graphic. But it's hey, it's war. War is hell. Yeah. It always will be. It always was and always will be. And, um, you know, it's um, it's there for a reason. It's not it's not the violence is not gratuitous, but it is horrific. And that's part of the story. Um, now, I had um, oh the neighbors. You want to talk about the neighbors or you want to talk oh, about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, they're 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 a huge part of the story. Yeah. The mums, right? M-U-N-M-U-N-M, Sam and his children, Grace. Will and Grace, <laughs> there's even a little line about the TV show there. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Emily. And yeah, yeah. They're, they're an interesting uh, uh, family unit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, again, it, it, it mirrors what happened in, uh, in Geiger and the people that, that, um, that Tariq meets in Geiger. Um, this family, uh, the circumstances are very different because this is a, definitely a more, um, you know, somewhat realistic world than what we see in Geiger. It takes place both first in Vietnam and later, uh, I think like in the, the 2000s early two mm-hmm. thousands maybe or, or later. Um, and they're just like a very fun, the family vibe a little bit, just a tiny bit reminds me of, again, what Jeff Johns and Gary Frank created with, uh, the Shazam family in the, in, in the reboot, just oh. a very kind of like, okay. A little like it's this clever, um, kind of, wise guy kind of family, you know, they're all this like kind of uh, like scratches, you know, um, and they, uh, their father moves them out of state because of, uh, you know, I think something that happens with, with, um, with their mother, I think Lee passes away and uh, he wants to start over and they move in next door to Muddy, Wa- to, uh, Muddy Davis, um, who in the, in is the Midwest known- from San Francisco to the Midwest. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and Middle he's known to the world. Yeah. He's known to the world as the creator of the comic strip, uh, Junkyard Joe, which nobody knows that during Vietnam that there was a real robot, um, which I won't get into his origins because that's part of the fun of the story, mm-hmm. um, that just appeared kind of out of nowhere and helped him and his uh, his his friends over there um, and he saved Muddy's life. Um, Muddy kind of convinced himself that this was a dream uh, and created uh, Joe for a, a comic strip, and it became this huge success, you know, pop culture icon. Um, and that's basically where, like, the story kind of, you know, picks up from. Yeah. Um, so good. Um, again, the villains are super villainous. Um, the mysteries are there. Great characterization, art, and heart. It's, it's such a good book. Yeah, and, and uh, Muddy, when the, when the story begins, when we get to the present, Muddy has uh, just sent in his last uh, Junkyard Joe strip. He ends the, uh, the story because previously that summer, he had lost his wife of uh, 50 years. And he, he, he uh, tells, um, I forget who it was now, um, it may have been the family, it might have been the guy at the, um, the uh, Veterans Administration that, you know, uh, his wife was the inspiration because he would show her every strip and unless she gave the okay, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to print it. And so he's, he's had a great loss in his life. Um, that seems to be the theme in these both books is loss and then how you deal with them, which is, you know, the human condition. I mean, we, we all have loss in our lives. We all lose loved ones. Um, and, and then, you know, how, how do you go on? How, how does, you know, you go on because you're human, but how do you deal with it? And uh, Muddy's kind of been, you know, he's kind of retreated into himself. Uh, his wife used to go into town all the time. She was beloved, but he hasn't been in town in such a long time. And uh, he just wants to be on this little farm that I believe was her father's. He mentions that in the, uh, when he's in Nam. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back, marry my girl. Her father passed away just recently and left at the farm. That's all he can think about. Um, and, and it's just... The, this man is so, you just, you want to root for him so much and, you know, you just want to, you know, hold him and, 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 and say, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. And that's when Joe shows up and yeah, um, Joe has an infection and infinity for, uh, for, for Muddy. And um, we see how that develops as the story develops. Um, I don't want to give away too much, but as I reread it this morning, uh, there was something I noticed. Now, I don't know if this is, you know, um, I'm not sure. I was look, trying to look it up on my phone, but um, uh, Joe is also called uh, Unit Beta, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Now, oh, geez, I, I should try to find this. Uh, let me just try if I can find this on my phone so I don't make a jerk of myself. <laughs> um, let's see. Greek alphabet. The first letter in the Greek alphabet is alpha. The second letter is beta. So when I realized this, after reading it the second time, Unit Beta... It got me thinking of the old original Star Trek episode, uh, The Ultimate Computer, and the M5. And it was McCoy or somebody said, well, you know, what happened to 1, 3, and 4? 1, 2, 3, and 4? Well, they weren't perfected yet. So I'm thinking that there might be a unit alpha out there somewhere that we may see later on down the road. 
Uh, just, I don't know if that's, you know, I'm reading too much into this, but. Um, I wouldn't know, be surprised and with someone be, like Jeff Johns. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so maybe, maybe um, uh, uh, our Junkyard Joe is going to have a, 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 an adversary that's going to be somewhat like him or a prototype, you know, kind of like Dater and his brother War and and, uh, and things like that. So um, there's so much he puts into it. You know, we're all building in Geiger on a grand scale after after a nuclear war. We're all building on a much smaller scale in this little town, Melody. What's it called? Melody. What's the name of the town? Oh, oh I forgot. I forgot. I want to say Melody Falls, but I don't think that's it. But it begins with the word Melody, the Melody. And uh, it is a typical small town. We get to see it. And it looks like a nice place to live. And then some things happen later on, which we won't get into, but... Um, um, the book has an ending. The, this original story it does have an ending, and it, it seemingly has a a happy ending. But uh, we know that for a fact that it's going to be a, an ongoing junkyard Joe book coming up, and the um, and the villains. Well, we won't say what happens to the villains. But I just oh, think I it's, yeah, I think well, also one. his appearance. You know, you know, he pops up in Geiger, so his story is definitely not you know. Um, over. Not over yet. Not not by a long shot, right? Yeah, because a guy takes place many years after the end of this book. Um, but it's uh, well, one thing I kind of uh, kind of came at me when I was you know, thinking about this book recently. Um, you know, I've, like like you, I've, I've read I, I believe almost everything Jeff Johns has ever written. Um, it, I really can't think of anything I didn't read of his maybe uh, I, I really can't I know I read all of his DC stuff and mm-hmm. I believe I read, I read everything anyway one thing I noticed he has like this and he's mentioned it before in in, in some interviews where when it, it started off with Star Girl and well Star Spangled Kid back then um uh and his JSA work he very much likes the idea of family when they're not necessarily blood related mm. um something he likes about that and you could i mean that's that's why courtney was star girl and not someone related to you know pemberton right. um that's why a lot of his jsa legacies so many of them uh, i would say most of them um have no blood relation they were you know maybe a sidekick or or someone who just took up the name because they were inspired you know what i mean um it's you know so many things and this too in both geiger and junkyard joe um they both get second families who are not related to them. And um, I think that's kind of an important thing to Jeff Johns. It, it's, he's very much of the mind, you know, that family is, isn't always blood. Um, sometimes it's the people that you choose, to, you know, to have in your life. And um, this feels like kind of a, a through line through a lot of his work, you know. It does. Yeah, if you remember the original um, uh, Infinity Inc. comic book way back in the, in the late 80s, uh, they were all the the uh, the children of the original JSA. They were they were they were, you know, blood related. And here we are now. Yep. And he's he's I don't even know if that continent would even exist anymore. If the Infinity Inc. even exists in the DC universe anymore, but uh, Johns is 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 uh, definitely done what you said. Um, you know, um, there's the old saying you um, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. But in in John's world. Um, if you play your cards right, you can pick a, you, you can pick your family. Sometimes out of necessity, sometimes out of tragedy, uh, you find a new family. And um, yeah, so that's definitely a running theme in, in, in his work. And, yeah, I mean, you know, in some cases he creates them and sometimes he has, uses ones that exist. He's very much about using ones, though, that don't have a, you know, a family connection like, um, you know, Michael Holt, the newer Mr. Terrific, um, isn't related to the original. Um uh, Cyclone, uh, you know, is basically kind of a, a red tornado name connection, if nothing else, but not, mm-hmm. you know, no, not blood related. Oh, not that you could be to, to, you know, the Android, um, as you know, Courtney, you know, Stargirl, um, you know, so many, uh, characters he used in this run and yeah. And this book as well, uh, these two books are as well. It's very much about family and about protecting the people you love. And, um, you know, a, a lot of heart, a lot, you know, a lot of horror, um, you know, uh, but it balances it out, and uh, they're very satisfying reads. They're very quick reads. I oh, yeah. both of them, uh, both I, I read both in one sitting. You, you can't put it down. 
Yeah, I, I read I read Junkyard Joe this morning in one sitting. Yeah, you you definitely can't put it down. And um, we know that John's started his career as an assistant to the late great Richard Donner, right? Yeah. And I I think Junkyard Joe. It reads like a film. It really does. Yeah. I mean, uh, so does Geiger. But you you realize that Geiger is a is a, is a world building, uh, beginning, uh, you know, offering of his of his new world. There's going to be uh, much more coming. But you could pick up Junkyard Joe and read this this graphic novel and put it down at the end and be very very satisfied. Like you just saw a uh, you know a major motion picture that you know, yeah that's definitely nice. yeah. yeah. I agree. It feels like a movie. Um, you know, Geiger to a, like a certain degree, um, maybe more because of, you know, um, Gary Frank's art can kind of bring that to anything, but Junkyard Joe, everything about it is like, a, it screams movie. Um, it's almost, you doesn't give that to a, a, you know, a director and just make it page for page. It's, it's so cinematic, you know? Yeah, um, the book would be the storyboard if you were making the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, Again, I love both these books, but I, I, I definitely I love Junkyard Joe uh, more. It's just uh, something about it. It's, it's 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 like you said before. It's unlike anything um, currently on the stands. Um, you know, certainly from the the, the big two publishers, but um, you know, I definitely think it's you know uh, one of the best comics. Both of these are other, some of the best comics being published. You know, these days. Yeah. I I had a reaction to Junkyard Joe that uh, originally when I first read it, when I first knew about him, when we saw him in the in the Geiger book, and then we we see at the end that that's gonna be a, there's gonna be a, a forthcoming Junkyard Joe story, and it reminded me of when I was a kid, what Marvel comics I didn't want to read because I thought the the characters looked just so dumb and stupid. Like, why would you want to read a, a book about a, a big green hulking monster who who can barely speak? That you know, how's that guy a superhero? Or you know, another guy who, who carries a hammer has got really long hair and looks like, you know, um, you know, a roided up hippie. <laughs> and then yeah, the, worst yeah. had to, the worst one had to be the Submariner. Like, oh, oh God, on. yeah. Give him a pair of pants at least, you know? <laughs> and and the way he speaks, especially Thor, Thor and Submariner with that pseudo Shakespearean speech of theirs. And I said, you know, I thought, well, and then a few years later, it's like, uh, what's this movie about a shark killing people? Jaws, this can't be any good. And I went to see that and I was blown away. And that's what I, my first initial thoughts of Junkyard Joe was, oh, I don't know, robot, we've seen this before. And then you read this and you realize, my God, again, a, a trope of science fiction and storytelling, the robot um, looking for its master, looking for its purpose. You know, God help us, V'ger in Star Trek, the motion picture. This little show, <laughs> Josh. Sorry about that, Josh. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, it's he pulls it off and... Um, it's like I'm so glad I've read this. <laughs> it's just, it is one of the best things, if not the best thing I've read in years, from anybody. Yeah, uh, yeah, it really is. Yeah, I'll tell you, I I feel like I, I put it off too long. I read Geiger. Yeah, I did um, too. I put it off for a long time too. Right. Even I put it off, and then I put it off even longer when I bought it. I was like, yeah, I'll get to it. I don't know why. I just kind of you know sometimes there's like a weird hesitation with uh like brand new things. Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I would. I had it there in my pile and I would just go and reach his am first or, you know, world's finest or flesh. Um, and, uh, you know, when I finally got to it, I, again, I couldn't put it down. I, I blew right through it. And I was just like texting you and everyone else who I know reads comics and was like, you have to check out this book. Um, so good. It's, it's like going to be like, you know, the birthday present for anyone I know this year <laughs> who, uh, <laughs> who was remotely interested in, in, in comics. Um, and exciting because, you know, Again, you know, ground floor. Um, there was a couple other issues that came out, like an eighty-page giant and those ground zeros. Um, there's the, there's uh, the eighty-page giant. I did. I read that last night with the first ground zero. And here's the first you know, ground zero uh, number one. Ground look at, look at those! Look, look at those beautiful covers. Gorgeous, so, aren't they? Yeah, look at that. Look at oh. that cover on there. Oh. And then there's this, which came out a few weeks ago. The anthology. Yes. Yep. Just Ghost Machine. Yeah. yeah, Ghost Machine, yeah. For for anyone, you know, maybe if you don't want to right away drop, you know, the which is not even a lot, the ten, eleven dollars for the uh the, the, tr the first trade of, of each of these books, if you want to get a little sampling. Um they're marked as three ninety nine, but I think most stores are selling them for two ninety nine because of this great deal um image gave with them to the retailers. But 
it's basically was it eighty pages, Joe, or sixty? I think it's about sixty. And um, I got my copy through mycomicshop.com because I was ordering some more Western comic books. And you know what I paid for this? Fifty cents. Uh, wow. Yeah, they had it on sale for fifty cents. <laughs> wow. So yeah, I'm telling you because I, I heard that uh, um, Image gave like an inc- like incredible deal to uh, to the um, retail. retail. I think it's, I think it's, um, I think basically it's they still had to pay like whatever the wholesale the cost is. So maybe two dollars, dollar fifty an issue. But then they, no matter um, whatever amount of issues they ordered, they gave them th- that exact same number in free copies. That's amazing. That's incredible. Unlike uh, and uh, unlike last year when Marvel. Reproduced a Hulk number one eighty one, the first appearance of uh, of um, Wolverine, right? And they did it re- a regular facsimile and a foil facsimile, and both of them were like almost four ninety nine, almost five ninety nine, and that's what they charged the retailers. They charged the retailers this the retail price. So now, if you're a retailer and, and the book says five ninety nine, you're going to sell for seven ninety nine. Your customer's going to say, "What? What's this?" So, yep. but you know, Image and Johns work something out. Uh, we know what Mark Millar has been doing uh, with his dollar ninety nine books for the past few years. Yeah. So there, there are things going on in the industry that you know not everything is bad, not everything is just you know uh, a cash grab like with DC and Marvel and all these these incredibly long and boring uh, events. So uh, if you're looking for something to read, the, you know it's all into the, in some of these independent books because you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Yep, and, and just so you know, this you know this is an anthology book, like Joe said, but it's um, it's not all Jeff John's story. Yes, there's a um, a story basically about a character that's in the you know the Geiger the um un you know unnamed universe named Redcoat, which is a yeah. immortal uh, immortal Redcoat soldier uh, from the Revolutionary War, and um, he ties into things coming later with um with Geiger. So basically, it's the first story by you know uh, Johns and I think Brian Hitch uh, mm-hmm. are telling the story of um, both uh, actually I think it's Gary Frank too uh, of Geiger but also Redcoat story and how it's kind of connected and um, in there is also another Jeff Johns story with Jason Favick about a character called uh, Rook that's going to mm-hmm. be uh, like a space story um, on the same imprint but not in the unnamed universe I think it's going to be its own thing. Um, and then there's a couple stories by other great um, former mainstream writers like Peter Tomasi, um, uh, and who uh, he wrote, he wrote two stories, I believe, um, uh, that were that were really good. But for the price, two ninety nine, even if even if you pay three ninety nine, you're getting sixty pages plus of just amazing content, and it's like a, a sampler of what they're going mm-hmm. to be putting out in the future because there will be an ongoing Geiger um, series. There will be a on, there'll be a red coat series. Not sure if it's ongoing, and I'm sure there's going to be more uh, junkyard Joe. There's going to be this Rook series. There's going right. to be these two Peter uh, Tomasi series um, that look good. Um, you really you can't go wrong picking up this issue. I mean, the art alone is gorgeous. Yeah, and those series you mentioned, a few of them are starting in April, so very soon. Yeah. So uh, you know, go to your local comic shop and tell the uh, pride that you want to. Add that to your folder, or order them from wherever. But make sure you get them because I think you you'll, you'll like them. Um, there's one thing I want to say about the ending uh, of uh, of Junkyard Joe without giving away the ending. But I need to you know this this also hit me. Um, Muddy has a, a line to the community to his town, and he's he's uh, pleading for Joe. I won't tell you why he's pleading for Joe and what happened before that. Junkyard Joe. But Muddy says, um, "I'm gonna. I ask. I'm. I'm asking you to please just love him back. Meaning Junkyard Joe. That's all we want when we come home. Meaning uh, a returning uh, veteran, whether it be a guy or a girl. And again, I. You know, I keep going back to this because I've, I've lived this. And I remember when these guys and girls came home fifty plus years ago. Some of them were spat upon, and some of them were looked down upon." And it was terrible. And it took a long time to build that, that uh, Vietnam War Memorial. So um, I, I, I thank Jeff Johns for this because um, we really need to... I don't want to get emotional here. Um, we, we, really, we really need to um, thank the people that fought in... You know, which was, yes, it was an immoral war, but they went and they fought in that war and many of them didn't come back. 
And I think this is a great tribute to those boys and girls. So um, I don't know if you're listening, Jeff, but thank you. Because I had family members over there. And it's, uh, that that uh, Junkyard Joe appealed to me on many levels, but that was one of them. So uh, I yeah. just, uh, just really enjoyed it. And it, it spoke to me. It really did. Absolutely. And I was trying to Google it just now because I, I don't remember the details, but I believe, I'm not sure if it's the first trade or the issues going forward, but I do believe that, um, uh, uh, and I, I do believe that a portion of the, um, uh, you know, the profits revenue from these books do go to like veteran, um, Good. assistance. Great. Um, you'd have to go, I, yeah, I didn't have too much time to Google it, but I believe that, um, at least the, um, Junkyard Joe book, um, proceeds, a portion of them do go to like, you know, help veterans, uh, I, I believe homeless veterans, but I'm not sure you'd have to uh, do a little more, uh, a little more, uh, research on it. Maybe I'll do that before, um, James posts this, uh, episode. So we can kind of have it on the, uh, Facebook and Instagram pages. Every day, um, in our country, every day, one home, at least one homeless veteran takes his or her life. So, um, you know, if, 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 if buying this book can help to save one life, you'll enjoy the story, it'll speak to you, and you might be helping someone. So that's another, yep. reason, why to buy it. another reason why to buy this book. And, and I'll, I'll say something, you know, um, being a longtime comic fan, I, I know that very often it's part of like the, you know, the addiction of comics or the, um, the completest kind of mentality a lot, most people who read comics have. I know that it goes so many years and hundreds of, of issues at a time sometimes where we continue to buy books that we don't love because mm. we're so used to it or we, you know, want to complete the run, right? Yeah. Complete the run, all that. And God, how many times do you look over at a box of books that you're like, I'm never going to reread these. They're, you know, you're not a fan, you know, buy, save the money. Don't buy that book. Buy these books. They're mm -hmm. really good. Um, I really, I yeah, I can't imagine anyone not enjoying them. That is the, the the highest bar we have currently out there in comics. As Keith said, there's a, the, the people associated, uh, Johns and Tomasi and Hitch and uh, Fabok and, and, and Gary Frank uh, and others, it just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I left a few out. I know I did. Uh, these are some of the, this is the cream of the crop. These are, these are the people that left DC and Marvel and uh, struck out on their own. And uh, I don't, I don't know if this is going to have the same uh, effect as when um, uh, the uh, Jim Lee and company left uh, Marvel to to form uh, back in the day the original um, Image Comics, right? Was it? Yeah, when yeah, like yeah. Um, and Wildstorm and, and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I got to tell you right now, folks, uh, this this is off to a better start because these stories have heart, as Keith has said. They have meaning. They have nuance. Um, they're about people. Yeah, it is pyrotechnics and there's, there's, uh, you know, um, uh, the typical things you would, you would want to see in a comic book, but there's, there's so much humanity and that's worth reading. Yeah. And you know, it's, um, these stories as opposed to when image first launched, I got nothing against when image first, uh, first launched. It wasn't my cup of tea, but, um, you know, later some stuff like in the, in the 2000s, you know, caught my eye a lot. Like, a lot of the Brubaker stuff and, you know, uh, mo mostly the Brubaker stuff. And of course, Brian K. Vaughan's wonderful saga. But um, these stories are about characters first. Um, then the early, you know, the early image 90 stuff was all, it was all art driven. And I don't mean that in an art storytelling sense. It, it was more flashy poses and costumes yeah. and all that. Um, this is story first both from the writing perspective and the, um, the penciler mm -hmm. and inker and colorist. Like it's about story and not flash, not about, it's not about variant covers or and it's not about poses and, and million pouches on your costumes and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, a, lot, it's, you a, know, lot of le a lot of leather, right? Yeah. These are a lot of love. Yeah. Um, this definitely, um, a much stronger start. Um, and I think, you know, like, like we said before, I think it's going to have a definitive ending. Uh, I think it's going to be an epic journey, probably around like 10 years total. I think I think it's we're going to get out of that. Um, and one other thing to note that there are 
there are other creators involved in this that don't have books that, that have been even announced yet. Um, yeah. One of them, uh, Brad Meltzer from Green Arrow and Identity yes. Crisis, he's going to have a book, uh, but we don't know what it is yet. Um, uh, again, uh, Peter Tomasi is working with um, uh, both Francis Manipal on one of the books, which is in uh, which there is a few pages in the um, the anthology book that Joe showed a cover to before. Uh, he's also working with Peter uh, Snyberg as well on another story there. Um, you know, and again, there's just uh, a lot, an incredible amount of talent here. There are more talent in this one little imprint at Image that Jeff John started up, in my opinion, that, that DC and Marvel have combined right now. And I love some of the stuff going on there. I love Mark Wade and Jeremy Adams. But um, this is just unrivaled with, with what they have here right now. Yeah, P Peter Snyberg worked on uh, Starman, right? Yeah, the yeah. second half. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. So it's, uh, it's names you'll know. Uh, and there's some new names, and that's good, too. Uh, you know, always need uh, new talent and fresh talent to come into the industry. But these are the, these are the, these are the guys that are on top of their game right now. And uh, I think they're off to a very good start. And I, I yep. wish them luck. And I... Uh, I've, I've pre-ordered my uh, copies already on discount comic book services for April. So I know I'm April. Them. Yep. Uh, I almost forgot the other day. I did the DC uh, pre-orders, and then I did like one or two Marvel books. That's all I read. And um, and then it's, oh, wait, oh, shoot. I, and then I read, Junk, I read, I read, I read Geiger, and it's, oh, I forgot. Uh, you know, Ghost Machine books. I got to get those ordered. And then yep, I, yep. Um, I guess we want to we want to wrap this up now, Keith. I mean, I think we, yeah, I think we said all we can without you know giving too much away. I think we've held ourselves in check pretty much about. Yeah, we, right? I, I I think we've been pretty good. It's hard not to uh, bring up certain things, but we want to get people into the book, and yeah. um, we don't want to spoil the, you know the big things. It's a journey worth taking. Um, again, uh, we can't recommend this book enough. Amazon has the first two, you know, the, the first trade for each book, uh, three series. Um, for about 10 or $11. I uh, can't recommend it enough. Mm -hmm. uh, get them both because you'll want to read them both uh, you know, right away. And then jump on, the, then go to your local comic shop and get the, uh, you know, the, the Ghost Machine one shot the and the, the Geiger Ground Zeros. And I, yeah. I think you'll be in, in a good place to kind of, um, you know, just, you know, to kind of get a feel for this world and then put the other books on your, on your pull list, you know, take a look. You can also, um, Ghost Machine has a website. You can also go there and kind of That's poke right. around okay. Yeah, see what, you know, something might kind of grab your attention. And one of the other books, you might not even, I mean, I doubt that you wouldn't like these books, but you might like one of the Peter, um, Peter Tomasi books. He's a fantastic writer. Um, you know, or you might like the Jeff Johns, Jason Fabot book, who they were the creative team of Batman Three Jokers. Uh, they have this space epic that looks, that's really, really good. Um, so yeah, again, Ghost Machine, Image Comics, Jeff Johns, and... Um, Gary Frank and a ton of other amazing uh, creators. Uh, definitely, I recommend checking out. Uh, so, Joe, um, since we wrap that up, do you have any uh, any other recommendations you'd like to to uh, to give to our listeners? Uh, you read anything new? Watch anything new? Well, yeah. Today is um, what? What's today's date? Where's my phone? Is it the nineteenth. 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 Well, we were no, no, I'm sorry. Eighteenth. Eighteenth. <laughs> My phone says February 19th, but who knows? Oh, um, today's Monday. I'm sorry. It's yeah. President's Day. I'm mixed up. That's right. So, but yes, I watched something yesterday that uh, blew me away, and that was the Stadium Series outdoor Ranger and Islander hockey game. I had to get that in. It was incredible. And I'm texting <laughs> back and forth with my nephew, Frank, who lives down in uh, Lancaster, South Carolina with his family. And he's the big Islander fan. I'm a Ranger fan. And... Um, and uh, we're going back and forth. And when the, when the Islanders were up 4-1, he texts me. He goes, they'll find a way to blow it. And, and, and with 10 seconds to OT, the Rangers won the game 6-5. And, <laughs> and he was livid. He, I mean, I can't even repeat what he was texting me. This is, this is a family podcast. But I, we, had a, we had a lot of fun back and forth. And the game was incredible. It was 80,000 people there. There was more action than it was in MetLife Stadium with both the Jets and Giants play. But there was more action yeah. in that one game than the entire season of Jets and Giant games in that in that in that building. So I, you know, um, I would recommend. Uh, this is shout out to my buddy Chris who turned me back onto hockey a couple of years ago. My recommendation is, you know, is we're in the we're in between football has ended, baseball hasn't started yet, 
if you if you like sports like I do, um, check out a hockey game, whether it be the Rangers, the Islanders, or the Devils. New York has area has three, three, um, uh, three hockey teams. As far as reading, what am I reading now? I'm reading some old. Oh, yeah, uh, I ordered more Western comics <laughs> from uh, from uh, my comic the other day. I'm really into the Rawhide Kid and Two Gun Kid and Kid Cult. They got great artwork. It's this Kirby and uh, and Dick Ayers and Don Heck and uh, Ross Andrew and Mike Esposito. So I would recommend if you have a hankering for something other than superheroes, first read these books that we just talked about for the last hour, and then maybe check out a few westerns. You know, so those are my recommend- recommendations, Keith. Great, great, thank you. Um, I have two. Uh, one thing is totally not comic book related. It's a, a documentary. I'm not sure if anyone, if you, Joe, or anyone else is a fan of uh, true crime, but I'm a big true crime buff. I watch yeah. a ton of it, uh, like too much probably. Um, and yesterday I watched one on Netflix called Lover, Stalker, Killer. Ooh. It is the craziest crime documentary you'll ever see. And when I say this, it's about a murder, so it is disturbing, of course, in a sense. But a lot of the ones I've seen recently are beyond disturbing, really showing you like a level of cruelty that is like uncomfortable. It's kind of like, like ones that haunted me for like a week after. This wow. one is just, this one's not that. Um, so if you don't want to watch anything that really kind of destroys you for a weekend, um, this is just, it feels like a movie. It's about a, a basically a, a guy met a woman on a dating app and, and he meets another woman and he gets stalked to this insane, insane point, And you will not believe what really happened in this. I was like standing up by the TV half the time. I, wow. I, I'm like, this can't even be real. And it's, it's real. Um, so it's, it's not long. It's like an hour long. It's called uh lover, uh, stalker killer on Netflix. It's brand new. Okay. Really good. Um, and again, it's not too disturbing for people who don't want to, you know, cause there's some, some content out there that is, you know, pretty, uh, pretty heavy this is a murder so it's not light but it's it's not to that level um the other thing i want to recommend is something that isn't new but it's new to me i told you joe that i was reading this but i i recently read uh uh jonathan hickman's um uh, x-men story at marvel the house of x powers of x mm-hmm. um it was two miniseries and then there's right. uh an x-men ongoing which i'm not done with yet but I think I think he leaves the book anyway in like three issues due to yeah. creative reasons with Marvel. But that being said, I know the eventual overall story arc uh, won't get resolved by Hickman. But even if you just read the House of X story, um, I didn't love Powers of X. It was it seemed like more of background to House of X, really. Mm-hmm. And I still I don't think it, I don't think it was necessary, honestly. Um, but what Jonathan Hickman did in those six issues of House of X, I thought was really uh, just incredible. I, I thought I'm not a huge Hickman fan. I think he's usually has these his concepts are too too big, yeah, uh, too high concept, and just like less like he's not really great with the character work. But in this, it's really incredible. I feel like it was almost. I know that other writers came in right later and ruined it apparently, but mm-hmm. um, it felt like to me at least, and some people like some X Men fans uh, may disagree. I don't have the kind of investment in these characters like like arco does you know i i love them but i got into them with like grant morrison's run so that's i went back and i read older stuff but okay. i didn't i didn't grow up with them i got into them like in my mid-20s um this to me feels like the only place on like where the x-men could have went after everything they've been through like the next logical conclusion Instead of just going back to Westchester and doing the same thing over and over. Now, I love that as a comic book fan. I want to be the, the familiar, you know, character uh, stuff. But this is what I would think what would have happened after everything that happened in Genosha um, or with the Scarlet Witch, you know, No More Mutants, all that. Like, I, I feel like this is the logical next step for all the mutants, not just the X-Men. Um, and an interesting setting, an interesting way they go about what they're what their new kind of game plan is to deal with humanity. Um, that was really good. Um, and it's really well told on top of that. Um, and I, I, it, I'm sad to hear that it gets you know, kind of um, sidelined and, and Hickman leaves later, but 
I say even this reading, the six issues, House of X, I can't recommend it enough. That's good because I've been putting it off, but now James has recommended it, now you've recommended it, so I think it's time I, I, I read that. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order the trades. And read it. I would say, you know, I would say it's unfortunate. I was looking too because I, I read it on the, the Marvel um, Unlimited app. I, I downloaded mm-hmm. it to check out some things again. And um, I read House of X first. I think you, I think it came out like House of X 1, then – and then uh, Powers of X one, like the like reading it concurrently. I just read House of X one through th- six, and then went to Powers of X. And again, it just gave like more background to what was going on in the main book. I don't think it's even necessary to buy the trade. I'd almost recommend just buying one to six of House of X. Okay, I feel like you'll enjoy it more. Um, I feel like the other book is expands too much on the, the concept that's told quite well in the in the, the main book. No, I- um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm eager to see what you think and like, like Arco thinks or other like longer time X-Men fans. Again, I came in with new X-Men and then went back and read some, a bunch of Claremont classic stuff and then read this and that. But, you know, my X-Men were like the, the Morrison stuff and later the Brubaker stuff, especially. Um, and even the, the Bender stuff I really liked until the end. Um, so I'm eager to see what you guys would think of it, or even just the basic concept of where they go, even if you don't love the delivery. I want, you know, because I think it's the logical step for them, but I wonder if you would disagree because you have a different connection to them than I do. Okay, it's worth a shot. I'm definitely looking at it. I think I rambled on way too long for a recommendation. <laughs> but <laughs> I recommended a hockey game, so, it, so you know, <laughs> a hockey game that was already played. Right. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. I, mean, <laughs> I think we did. I think okay. We did okay. Okay. Well, sounds uh, sounds good. I um, uh, just want to remind all of our listeners to please uh, go to the um, our Facebook page, our Instagram page, and, and and comment if you have any questions about Geiger or reading order or anything else about this book that you want to ask us. Please post your questions there. Also, if you don't already, please uh, like and subscribe to our um, our podcast on Spotify or Apple. Um, and thank you all for listening. We, you know, we love you guys and we appreciate you, uh, you giving us a listen every week. Take care.